Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to this IBMT 2020 online conversation with Professor Sir Paul Preston, Professor Helen Graham, and Dr. Richard Baxel. All three of today's speakers were at the forefront of those who supported the, um, the formation of the International Brigade Memorial Trust over 20 years ago, with Paul as our founding chair. And during that time, they have continuously given their extensive and unique knowledge to us and helped us to give our members the knowledge about the Spanish Civil War and the international brigaders who volunteered to, board, to fight in it. There were over two and a half thousand men and women from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales who went to join all comers of the world, all, all corners of the world, to go and support the Spanish people in their fight to defeat the fascists who were threatening their republic and the rest of Europe. Our aim as, register, as a registered charity is to commemorate the International Brigaders and to educate the general public about the Spanish Civil War. And today is one of several events that we organize and support around the country. Our Len Chrome Memorial Conference is coming up on the 19th of March in Edinburgh. And the theme is Scotland and the Spanish Civil War. The commemoration at our National Memorial in Jubilee Gardens, London, is always on the first Saturday of July every year. And our annual general meeting takes place in a different city in October. This year, it's in Manchester. We have a duty not to forget the volunteers who went to Spain and the sacrifices they made. If you're not already a member of the IBMT, please join us. And whether you're a member or not, please consider making a donation to help our work. Thank you all so much for being with us today. It is a free event, but we hope you will be moved to donate generously to the IBMT at the end of the conversation when you will find a link. Enjoy it. I know you'll be inspired. Over to you, Richard. Thank you very much, Marlene. Yes, yeah, so um, as you probably gathered, my name is Richard Baxel. I'm the former chair of the IBMT and I'm now their historical advisor. I'll be chairing today, so I'd like to echo Marlene in welcoming everyone to the conversation. Now, it will follow, for those of you who were here last year, it will follow a very, very similar format. I'm going to briefly introduce the two speakers who will then speak for about, I would think, 30 minutes or so. And then we'll be followed, we'll follow that with speakers, which as Ashmal has said, can we can do via the chat feature. So both the speakers, as Marlene has told you, have both played an important role in the IBMT. Helen Graham is Professor of Modern European History at Royal Holloway. She's written several books on Spain's Republic and the Civil War. And her The Spanish Civil War, a very short introduction, which came out in 2005, has now sold well, well more than 50,000 copies in English and has been translated into a number of languages. She's, uh, I understand she's currently working on a project on Franco's prisons, which has been supported by a three-year Leverhulme Trust major research fellowship. Sir Paul Preston is Emeritus Professor at LSE's Department of International History. He's also written extensively on the Civil War and Spanish history in general. His Spanish Holocaust was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize, and his latest monograph, Architects of Terror, Hatred, Paranoia, and anti-Semitism in Franco Spain comes out in English this year. And he's received numerous accolades and awards. And in 2018, he was knighted for his services to UK Spanish relations. Okay, so to today's topic of conversation, betraying democracy in Spain, British policy from non-intervention to Munich. Now, when this topic was originally conceived, well, appeasement was a bit of a hot topic in the media. 
I think partly due to the release of um, Netflix film called Munich, The Edge of War, which was based on a novel by Robert Harris. And some of the audience may also have read T Tim Bouvry's, which I think is excellent, Appeasing Hitler, Chamberlain, Churchill and the Road to War, which came out as a paperback a couple of years ago. However, events rather seem to have overtaken us, with the media currently full of images of the all too familiar horrors of war, the bombing of defenseless civilians, the desperate plight of refugees. It's perhaps not surprising that comparisons are being drawn between Spain in 1936 and Ukraine in 2022. Some of you may have seen yesterday's online Eye newspaper, which carried reports of Britons arriving at the Ukrainian embassy in London, looking to volunteer to fight in the conflict. This followed, of course, the Foreign Secretary's unexpected support for the idea of volunteers in an interview with the BBC last Sunday. Now, given this, I suspect that Ukraine is likely to feature either directly or indirectly in some, of, if not many, of the questions today. However, I do want to begin with the original topic, the context in uh, the war in Spain in the context of appeasement of Hitler and Mussolini. So um, perhaps, Paul, you could maybe begin, begin with an overview of British government's policy following the July coup and uh, Spain's descent into Spanish civil, into the civil war. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. I'm having a little chuckle because of your reference to Mussolini. Um, <laughs> which I wish I'd thought of that, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that you said that I wish to draw attention to, I was really quite surprised that you spoke highly of the book by Bouverie on app appeasement. I have to say I was pretty appalled by it because, okay. well, for, I mean, for reasons that we will be explaining in the course of today, but if you look in the index of it, I think there are three references to Spain, and sure. clearly, you know, if if ever there was a a, a case, a, a sort of case study for exposing the you know, the ludicrous nature of appeasement, it's the Spanish Civil War. I mean, it's been central to you know <laughs> the ants in my pants for the last fifty years that historians, not not specialists in the Spanish yes. Civil War have completely ignored the fact that, you know, the, the really decisive things that were happening in the run up to the Second World War were actually happening in Spain. One, anyway, that uh, that, that will become, I think, more obvious yes. as, as, as the three of us talk over, over, over the next uh, few minutes. One of the things that, I mean, I, I, I don't know how much of a surprise this will be to our fellow members of the IBMT. But one of the things that always rather amazes me is that, that most of the things one reads about the Spanish Civil War in the media, and certainly when one comes across online debates and so on, is the, I mean, the very obvious statement that absolutely crucial for Franco was the help of Hitler and as we now know in Mussolini. <laughs> However, one of the things that I think is forgotten time after time is the crucial role of the British government. And I think that obviously the, um, the, eventual, the, the eventual defeat of the Spanish Republic owes an immense amount to the Anglo-French policy of non-intervention. Now, I, I'm going to be stressing, as I guess we all will, the British role, because probably had the British not uh, strong armed the French, um, it is quite likely that, that you know, there might not have been the non-intervention policy, but it certainly was a British initiative. And why I would say that it was crucial in the defeat of the Republic was that for the obvious reason that it basically uh, emasculated the Republic, by preventing it, exercising its rights at international law to buy weaponry. And furthermore, um, the fact that the policing of the non-intervention pact of August 1936 
was placed partially in the hands of the navies of the Third Reich and Mussolini's Italy um, was a further uh, obstacle to the Republic. <laughs> The policy was ostensibly meant to prevent the escalation of the Spanish war into a wider European conflict. But actually, in the short term, it permitted covert support for Franco, and in the longer term, made the, the threat of the two axis powers much greater. In fact, it did nothing about the aggressive expansionist ambitions of, of, of the two axis powers, and it systematically hampered the Republic. It treated the legitimate government of the Spanish Republic as if it was the equal of the military rebels. Uh, and it failed, of course, to prevent Hitler and Mussolini providing uninterrupted support to Franco. That in turn, of course, forced the Republic, A, into the hands of unscrupulous uh, sort of private arms dealers who drained the Republic's uh, financial resources in return for uh, usually a lot, a lot of old scrap metal. In, in, um, and of course, the, uh, it, it, it obliged the Republic to turn to the Soviet Union. Now, I think again, a lot's been said and exaggerated about the health of the Soviet Union. Of course, it was absolutely crucial, uh, but it was always limited by the enormous other problems that the Soviet Union had to, had to face. And it also had the negative effect, of course, that it provided a spurious justification for the British government of saying, oh, yes, look, this proves that the Spanish Republic is the, is the puppet of, uh, of the Soviet Union. My central argument is that Chamberlain's government, almost to a man, but particularly Sir Samuel Hoare, known by Churchill as Slimy Sam, uh, that the, the members of the cabinet permitted their class prejudices uh, to overcome any sense of Britain's strategic interests. Um, this, I think, was summed up by a British diplomat speaking to the rather wonderful British correspondent in Madrid, Henry, Henry Buckley, who said, the Spanish war is a civil conflict and it is very necessary that we stand by our class. So, okay. Now, um, th that's my overall point. And I think that if in a way, without sort of rehearsing the whole of the narrative of the Spanish Civil War, um, you know, with, with an emphasis on British policy, I just want to say that really there are, there are two moments uh, in, in insofar as I'm arguing that the, the British policy basically doomed the Spanish Republic, that it was a betrayal of the Spanish Republic, I think there are two big moments. The first, as I've just said, was the, uh, the signing of the non-intervention pact in August 1936 and its immediate consequences, which of course uh, hampered the Republic over the next couple of years. But the other, of course, was the, the Munich Agreement um, in September of 1938. At that point, of course, the, the Spanish Republic was engaged in its last great battle, the Battle of the Ebro, in which it had thrown all of its resources in an attempt to, in the first instance, to stop Franco's assault on Valencia. And of course, it had been very successful at first. And in the first 10 days, it managed to conquer a significant amount of, of territory. Franco could quite easily have just ignored uh, the Republican um, advance or the attempt to, uh, to, to link up again the two divided sections of, of Republican territory and, and have just headed for Barcelona, which was henceforth undefended. In fact, he seized the opportunity to annihilate the Republican forces. And it was during this awful siege that I mean, roughly, it was getting worse from mid-September when the Munich Agreement was signed. And at that point, the only real chance for the survival of the Spanish Republic would have been for the Western powers to realize that 
actually the Republic was on their side, that war with the Axis powers was inevitable, and therefore it was in their interest. Even Churchill was recognizing this in his articles in the Daily Telegraph, uh, that basically it was you know, the, the only chance for the Republic was to recognize this. At the time, after Munich, Churchill actually said to the government, you had a choice between diplomacy and war. You chose diplomacy. Now you will have to face war. And, and, and basically, um, you know, that, that was what doomed the Republic. It also significantly changed Soviet policy because the Munich, of course, convinced Stalin that really what the, the Western powers wanted to do was to turn Hitler against him. And that by appeasing Hitler, uh, it put the Soviet Union at risk. And so, of course, he starts to think about what would eventually be the, the uh, Malatov, um, sorry, Ribbentrop. I can't even speak properly now, but anyway, the, 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 the pact that was made in August 1939 <laughs> between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. So basically, I'm saying that the, the betrayal was there, it was massive, and it has these, if you like, two major points, August 36 and September 1938. And now I'll let someone sensible in the form of Helen take the, take the stage. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't got that much to say. Um, can people hear me? Because there was yes. a bit of a problem before, right? Okay. Um, I mean, the, what, the, before I kick off, I just, uh, obviously the thing about non-intervention is it's already, it's a policy that starts when the British haven't got their, pre already haven't got their preferred outcome, which is to say a quick Francoist victory. I mean, non-intervention isn't the opening gambit. It's the result of the failure of what, British Foreign Office, what the British establishment government are in hoping will happen, which is to say there will be a rapid, ins well, should we call it historically correctly, an insurgent victory at that point, which is to say, so they stop, you know, so they don't allow the, the Republican Navy to refuel in Tangier and, and, and other places, you know, basically the, the non-intervention is the result of the failure of, of, of the insurgents to win, right, immediately. So, of course, the question is immediately, well, why are the British on the anti-democratic side. Um, and it's a question that you know, I've spent 40 years trying to explain to students. And I was thinking in, in, ahead of this session, you know, how the, the reactions of students learning about the Spanish Civil War and British policy has changed over the 40 years of, of you know, my teaching incumbency. And in a sense, they all, you know, you think about when I started the 1980s, 1990s, they all struggled with the notion of, of, of what Britain was in regard to that policy that that it had, it had unrolled, or you know, on this invention and so forth, and in a sense, you know, we, we stand at the moment as if we've slipped through a crack in time, you know, with Ukraine. Well, let's go even further back through a crack in time to Britain in 1936 or in the 1930s. All of those students that were struggling with understanding the kind of dichotomy between Britain, the democracy, and, and its policies towards Spain were misunderstanding the nature of the British policy and society in 1936. They were seeing it through the eyes of the, of the post-Second World War period, you know, the cataclysm of 19. 39 to 45, which birthed a National Health Service, Mass Education Act, um, Mass Secondary, Free Secondary Education, a whole series of things which were, if you like, the coming of social democratic rights to Britain. But if we go back to, if we, you know, we rewind to 1936 and the start of the, of the coup in Spain, um, basically Britain was the mother of parliaments, the, you know, the political democracy, but it was not a social democracy. Uh, it was not a social democracy at all. I mean, politics was the preserve, notwithstanding the Labour Party, politics was the preserve of a fairly small social elite. And when, you know, the coup erupted in Spain, I mean, in a sense, the national, you know, the government, the British government is looking to, you know, obviously preserve British imperial hegemony abroad, which is obviously under threat in all the ways that Paul's explained, but also to maintain a form of social peace and hierarchy at home, uh, which looks nothing like what seems to be happening in Spain with the Republic, which is to say, you know, 
um, educational reform, some form of socioeconomic leveling. I mean, obviously it's often exaggerated. The Republic had great dreams. It had very little time to achieve things. But the threat of that example to, to, a, to a British conservative policy, because such it was in 1936, was quite great, I think. So in a sense, the thing that students struggle with, which is the kind of the apparent contradiction between, um, yeah, Britain needed, wanted to preserve British foreign office, government wants to preserve the status quo abroad, but it also wanted to preserve the status quo at home. Uh, and in a sense, you know, what the Spanish Republic stood for, at least symbolically, and why so many people went to defend it was precisely what they weren't interested in, you know. Um, so in a sense, we, it, we can't look at, you know, the nature of, of British democracy through the lens, you know, retrospectively of the Second World War and what that achieved. Um, so in a sense, um, you know, we, get, we should go back and think about, you know, what, what it, what, the way in which Britain looked then to understand this apparent contradiction of, you know, basically siding with Franco. Um, and then obviously, you know, the, as Paul has just telescoped, the war then becomes something else. I mean, it then becomes, a, a, you know, a real a threat to, because obviously had Franco won or had the insurgents won right at the beginning, you know, we can't do counterfactual, but none of the other things obtain. But in a sense, once in, Franco is in, in order to win hitched to the axis, um, then it becomes a completely different ball game. But I think to one, you know, we can only understand, you know, historians have to explain things chronologically and, you know, explaining British policy, I mean, in a sense, it's another explanation as to why they clung to it for so long, but why that was the policy in 1936. I think there is no contradiction at all, if you think about what, what Britain looked like. You know, I always think of, you know, Patience Darton's wonderful stories in, you know, to, in Angela's biography about her, you know, she was a midwife in the East End of London and, and, and fighting with the hospitals and the doctors and this tremendously hierarchical sort of society for her mothers, um, her expectant mothers. In, in a sense, you know, th there are so many social documents that give us an insight into what Britain looked like in the 1930s. Um, in, and how traditional and hierarchical a society it was. So I think in a sense, there isn't that contradiction, um, but you know, maybe I think it's important to hang on to that before, before we kind of start to talk about um, you know, current day parallels or whatever. But it is, it is that point that um, this was Britain pre-Beveridge, pre-Butler, you know, pre all of those huge economic uh, socioeconomic reforms, which were the which were the product of the Second World War. I mean, you know, if you know, it's axiomatic for 20th century uh, your, uh, historians of Europe to talk about, you know, the First World War, the Great War of 1418 brought political, you know, universal suffrage to more places, while the Second World War brought social democracy. So in a sense, we cannot interpret um, British policy towards Spain through a post-1945 lens. Um, or indeed through a Cold War lens, but that's another story. Um, so I think, you know, that's that's really, that's the point I would want to make, that, that there isn't a contradiction, um, that in a sense, you know, to say, you know, this is a slightly provocative title, betraying democracy, well, yeah, non-intervention did, as Paul has just pointed out, but in a sense, they weren't in the game to, they weren't actually in the game to protect that, um, political project in, in Republican Spain because it wasn't what they understood as a, a desirable sort of internal arrangement. Um, so, so there isn't really a contradiction. Um, Munich, of course, at the other end is is you know it's more it's more readily understood. You know the, the classic thing about Chamberlain misunderstanding the nature of Nazi power, you know, again, the gentleman's agreement, the old, the, the old, I mean, in a sense, that fits with what I'm really saying about their understanding of what British, you know, internal arrangements should look like too. I mean, they hadn't understood that Germany, you know, the, the, the policy in society in Germany had changed too. So basically there isn't a contradiction, um, but, you know, obviously it was a betrayal of democracy. Can I ask a question relate, well, loosely related to that? which is that um, Chamberlain famously referred to Czechoslovakia as a faraway country of which we know nothing. nothing. Yeah. yeah. And I wonder how much that was also true of Spain. Um, to what extent then, because there was all these reports coming out from people who were running away from, from the coup and they were giving hysterical reports to newspapers 
there was uh, Sir Henry Chilton, who was clearly no friend of the Spanish Republic. So how much of the policy was a result of kind of misinformation, misunderstanding and ignorance? And how much of it was done in the full knowledge of the fact that they were essentially sacrificing Spanish Republic on the on the kind of the altar of appeasement, as it were? Well, I mean, well, obviously, Paul want to come in here, but I just in a sense that, you know, the, the you know, Whitehall's filterage of what was going on in Spain comes via, you know, there is there is a long relationship between um, Spanish high society and British high society. And that that, in a sense, we filter the stories to, to fit our view of the world, don't we? I mean, it's, it, you, know, you can talk about black propaganda or lies or misinformation, but we also filter reality to fit our understanding of the world. So in a sense, you know, you can encapsulate this problem in terms of how the British establishment or the British government interpreted stories about violence from Spain. I mean, obviously it's a civil war, it's violent. Um, that, that Franco, it was very, it was regrettable in the, what they, what had, I mean, obviously they didn't have half what we know now to be the case in, in, at their disposal information wise, but there was, there was a kind of qualitative difference in the way in which um, what happened in the Franco zone was unfortunate, regrettable, but order being put back into the situation. Whereas where the, when, whenever there were reports of, obviously there was, a, there was a state crisis in the Republican territory, but whenever there were, you know, in a sense, even when the Republic got back into public order control and the, you know, for good or ill, but basically there was a Republican government which was in control. Then when it was in a sense, banging heads together, the British reaction was, official reaction was, well, there you go then, terribly violent, terribly violent. So in a sense, violence is also not a neutral concept. It depends yeah. on what you think of the perpetrators or the those carrying it out in a sense. So the, the differential reaction to the violent realities of war were already filtered via a preconceived notion of, of what Spain was and what the right, the, the correct Spain was and who should be in control. So reports coming from, from Franco's territory or insurgent stroke Franco's territory and then the Republic were not were not you know objectively um, analyzed I mean there's much talk of you know um, you know official papers being objective uh, I remember what this sorry I'll stop here because I'm sure Paul wants to say things but I always remember um, somebody giving a paper about international brigades at a, a, a conference and saying, you know, we have to understand that these are subjective uh, accounts and testimonies and blah, blah, blah. And, I'm th and, and, and here I'm going to contrast this with what I've read in the Foreign Office papers in the National Archives. And I'm thinking, and you think, what is the subtext here that you think that they don't also have their subjectivity and their, their kind of, you know, their unspoken assumptions to use the great expression of um, James Joel's, you know, the, the un, unspoken assumptions of the, of the official paperwork. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, one's preconceptions, British official preconceptions, filtered information, and even aside from misinformation or disinformation or black propaganda. Or whatever. So, yeah. Paul, sorry. Paul, did you want to come in? Um, well, just to, to go back to, to the way uh, Richard posed his question, making the, you know, the comparison with the the statement that was made, you know, that Czech, Czechoslovakia was a faraway land of which we know nothing. That certainly could not be said at the time of Spain. First of all, as, as you know, Helen has pointed out, the so many Spanish tops went to the same public schools, particularly the Catholic ones, Ampleforth and uh, um, Stonyhurst, etc. So there were a lot of links between upper class. Um, it, you know, English toffs and the offspring of the Spanish producers of the set of the sherry that they drank so much of. And the most extreme cases, of course, the Duke of Alba, who uh, was not only a Duke in Spain, um, but he was also a Duke in, in Scotland. He was the Duke of Berwick on Tweed. Uh, I can't remember what number in line he was to the British throne, but it was quite high up, maybe fourth or something, you know. So obviously the idea that, um, you know, the English upper classes or the British upper classes didn't know what was going on, um, I think falls down on that point. It also falls down on the fact that, of course, there were, there were, far, there were far more, uh, British investment in Spain than there was in Czechoslovakia. 
So, of course, uh, a lot was known about the takeover of factories and so on, in, particularly in, in Barcelona. So clearly the owners of, of factories were, you know, were making their complaints. And of course, there was greater diplomatic representation. I mean, the the places where there were where ambassadors or the embassies were, even if the ambassadors had uh, moved to the south of France, the place where there were consuls were, of course, the places, you know, the biggest towns in the Republican zone: Madrid, Barcelona, and Valencia. Valencia. And the consuls in those places, and that uh, were also reporting in a way that was immensely critical of the you know the working class takeover in the uh, you know in in the republican area and another ut utterly key issue i think is that the because there was well a because there was virtually no no diplomatic representation in the areas where you know in the first months of the, of the war Franco's advance was taking place, so the great, you know, the, bringing the Foreign Legion and the the Moroccan mercenaries across the the Straits, and then the great advance from Seville up to up towards Madrid. All of that and the massive atrocities that were taking place were not reported. There were no diplomatic representatives to do so, apart from, of course, German and Italian ones who reported favourably on it. And the, the other point that, that is, needs to be made is that, relatively speaking, the Republican press services were pretty open. There was a degree of censorship, but it was usually about military things. But it was it, the, the correspondents, the famous correspondents who were posted in the Republican zone, like Henry Buckley, who I referred to before, Jay Allen, Herbert Matthews, lot, lots of them had a, a degree of freedom that no Western or no British or French or American correspondents in the Francoist zone had. So there was literally no reporting in the liberal press in the democracies of the atrocities. And of course, necessarily that tipped the balance in terms of certainly middle-class public opinion about what was going on. And I think it also had a bit of an effect even on opinion within the, within the Labour Party. Okay, perhaps I can now start to open it up to questions that are coming in. Um, so I've got here, um, even before Soviet aid to the Spanish Republic, was there a connection between Britain's anti-communist instinct fear and its anti-democratic instinct fear? How does this relate to its attitude towards popular front politics in Europe in the 1930s? Which I guess is probably directed to you, Helen, but I'm sure um, you're, you both can have an opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, well, in a sense, well, if, if you want if you want the genealogy of anti-communism, it would be better for Paul to start. But in a sense, I, I would want to interpret the anti-communism of the British um, establishment as a. It, it, in a sense, it's it's a it's a it's a code. Well, it's certainly a code for the disruption that the social and economic reforms of the Republic. Um, represented. I mean, after all, there was no way at the time any propaganda could really, you know, big up the, the Spanish Communist Party, which was tiny, you know, mm -hmm. it was absolutely tiny. I mean, it only becomes a mass force with middle class membership, as it happens, ju really during the Civil War af after the military coup. So the notion that there is, you know, this kind of this conspiracy, it was very, I mean, in a sense, it's, it's handy, it's, it's very well manipulated by Franco, but in a sense, um, it's more a dislike of, a sulfurous dislike of, of social reform. Um, you know, I mean, I remember one, sorry, I'm, you may think I'm going off topic, but in a sense, it's part of my, like, I mean, my, my lifelong campaign to try and um, deconstruct what we mean by anti-communism, you know, in terms of, you know, there's a discourse which is used, which is about, you know, 
so you know the Soviet danger and um, Soviet encroachment, which of course is very problematic subsequently because we read Spain back through the Cold War. I mean, it, all the time we do that. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. we assume, you know, people have got it in their heads that the Soviet Union was a superpower. In 1936, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it was an appeasing power looking inward and doing horrible things to its own citizens as it happens, but that's another story. It was not a superpower. And it was not, you know, you know, this idea of reds under that. There is a, there's a dislike of it because of course it represents a different economic order. But inside, the dislike, um, of, if you like, British polity establishment or for the Republican policy and what it represented. I always remember in 1938, I mean, I'm, I, I quoted this, but uh, coming across a report um, about um, the, the, the PSOE, the Social Democratic um, Justice Minister of the time, who was an Asturian Labour uh, miners leader called Ramon Gonzalez Peña. And he's described as a tinker from Asturias. Um, <laughs> which I think slipped through the weeding, the weeding net um, operating inside FO stuff, or maybe it wasn't considered important enough. But what I'm trying to get at is the, the, the kind of anti-communism is actually you know, anti-change. Uh, and yeah, of course, there's an obvi of letter and there's the whole, there's the fear of the Soviet Union and you know, the, the, the whole kind of deluge from 1917. But in the sense, if you want to inter interpret it in terms of how that plays out on the ground in Spain, um, it's a dis it's basically a a, a, a where and then of course in a sense I suppose you could say that you know the the you know Hitler and Mussolini used it to keep Britain off in terms of you know in, in well, we're, you know we're fighting an anti-communist crusade you know but in a sense it's a discursive you know construction but basically what it's what, what everyone's really talk, what the British are really talking about is stopping things being different and it's an anti-leveling um, you know, agenda. Um, so yeah, you can, you, I mean, I'll hand over to Paul because you can do a kind of genealogy of, of you know, the, the kind of, you, you know, the anti, the, the entente against the third international and Franco himself was a, you know, a, 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 an assiduous pen pal of all the white Russians who ran this thing out of Switzerland. Is that not right? That's right, Paul, isn't it? Sort of the, um, the entente against the, the third international. But in a sense, what's, what's coming together is a, is a, you know, in a sense, the, the, the kind of, if you like the crystallization, um, the galvanization of the European right against social change. You know, they, it's against the Soviet, but actually it's against social change in Europe, which is a, a juggernaut, which is, you know, which the, the, the Great War of 1418 has, you know, unleashed. You know, Horthy can't stop it in Hungary. You know, the, the, his, he, you know, he, he, you know, expels, you know, troublesome people who end up going to fight in Spain. But in a sense, it's a, it's, there's a, there's a social, process of social change happening, which nothing's going to stop. But anti-communism is in, in a sense a bulwark again. And obviously it has got the bogey, the bogey regime, which is the Soviet Union, but it's about, it's about change in Europe. And anti-communism is a discourse about change in Europe, not about what the Soviet Union is going mm. to do because it's not a superpower. Anyway, so Paul, the, the Entente against the Third International and, and Franco's assiduous reading thereof, no. Well, or whatever else you want to talk about, <laughs> you have to talk about that. Yeah. Well, go, I, I mean, absolutely, I, I, what Helen said is absolutely right, that uh, the threat of the, of the Soviet Union was wildly exaggerated. But going back to the original question, you know, was there uh, anti-Soviet feeling in the, in the British establishment? Which I think well, yes, <laughs> yes. Then obviously, I think we need to remember, you know, the Cold War, began in 1917 and it was driven by fear of, of as Helen has just said in a way that you know the the forces that were unleashed by the collapse of the empires in Eastern Europe terrified the, the you know conservatives all over Europe and the most obvious point to be made here is of course that the British sent forces to fight against the Russian revolutionaries um, and the other thing I think, apart from, of course, we can take for granted, I think, that there was uh, fierce anti-Soviet feeling in the, um, in the British establishment, the British press, that in the run-up to the Spanish Civil War, the, this had been provoked by, very cleverly by the Spanish right, which had unleashed the so-called communist documents, which were a series of of faked documents, I mean, one of the early 
not the not the earliest, but an early um, eruption into public life of fake news, claiming that you know there was there was a, a carefully plotted uh, communist conspiracy to take over Spain and so on, and at least at first that was widely believed within the within the British establishment. So yeah, you know, <laughs> short answer is yes. There was a lot of anti-Soviet feeling. Okay, I'm being asked a question less about British reactions and more about um, within Spain itself. Um, what was it? What was it about Spanish the Spanish democratic project that so I mean it partly so offended uh, Western powers, but also um, helped launch the coup and was was what people wanted to fight for? Why? What was it about the Spanish Republic? that firstly encouraged the generals to attack it, but also to encourage all the Republican defenders, including anarchists, to defend it. What, 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 what were the reforms that, that, were, that we're talking about here? Well, the, as far as the, you know, the Spanish conspirators were concerned, the things that they found most outrageous about the Republic, obviously, were its social reforms, because many army officers with the offspring of, of landowners and so on. So that, that was certainly a big issue, uh, the attempt at, at, at agrarian reform. Education reform was something that seriously offended them. I mean, I found lots of, ex lots of statements to the effect that, you know, you don't want to be giving these people uh, the, the possibility of reading and writing. It only gives them ideas. And ideas, of course, uh, will undermine our control of, of, of society. So that was uh, something that deeply offended army officers. Women's rights. That was an, another thing that in a highly misogynistic uh, Spanish upper class, the, 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 the giving of, 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 of rights to women meant that the advocates of women's rights, such as Margarita Nelka, were simply dismissed as, as, as whores. So that was another thing. And then, of course, a big issue, given that most Spanish generals, well, all Spanish generals, actually, almost without exception, were uh, fierce centralists, was, of course, the whole idea of regional autonomy. So all of those things uh, were what they were really up to. They were basically, uh, the uprising was about stopping the challenges to the existing order made, and this I think links up with a, to a lot of what Helen said, uh, that was made by the Republic. But of course, it was all said, oh, no, you know, what we're trying to do is, is put an end to disorder. The disorder was very carefully provoked in order to provide that excuse. So that, that would be my take on it. Helen? Well, yeah, I mean, and I'm not going to rehearse all, you know, you've just rehearsed the, the set of reforms, which are all part of the story. I mean, you can kind of collapse them mostly, not almost, almost everything into this idea of this absolute ap apocalyptic, uh, no, apoplectic rage at the possibility of being told that they didn't have a divine right to rule Spain. That, you know, that Spain was consubstantial with a deeply hierarchical system, you know, imbued with a very particular kind of Catholicism, author, you know, an authoritarian hierarchical, you know, the most fundamentalist Catholic church in Europe. Um, which was then, you know, very conveniently used to, you know, in a sense, uh, as a kind of form of divine totalitarianism, as the Cardinal Prime of Spain said in 1934, to, um, you know, Francoism was that. But basically, just, just this absolute, you know, our right to rule. And in a sense, you know, you can almost, you can see that through Francoism, that, you know, the, the shape, the face of Spain sh changes dramatically socio socioeconomically, becomes an industrial economy by, you know, the 1960s. But the way in which polity, politics, and who is in, I mean, obviously it's a dictatorship, but, you know, the, the kind of closing down of, 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 social, of social mobility, of any kind of mobility and change, and what, you know, Francoism calls social peace, which is stasis, paralysis, absolutely no change. That's, that was the shock of the 1930s. The apocalyptic, you know, the image of, of, you know, the Republic as the antithesis of all of this, of mobility, 
Um, that is really what they were fighting against. And, you know, you can collapse into this. Of course, the, you know, the huge economic stakes of, 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 of agrarian reform in the deep south of the Latifundia and, and all of the other things, the, the rights to regional sort of devolution in, in, in the historic nationalities, the Basque country and, and, and Catalonia especially, and all of those other things. But basically hierarchy was the, the right to reimpose a hierarchy in all of these things, not just in ec economy, but psychologically, you know, it was it touched them psychologically. That's that's where, in a sense, the the rage and the vile, you know, a lot of the violence comes from. Both of popular conservatism as well, not just of the you know the 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 the, the grand sort of the elites, but also of popular popular. You know, there was a huge unleashing of popular conservatism as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, coming back to British government policy. Um, I'm being asked if perhaps the word betrayal is, is too strong. Um, and the suggestion is being, or at least the question is being asked that maybe there were many people in, in the British government and the British governmental class who were scarred by the, the huge le levels of atrocities, and, uh, uh, sorry, of casualties in the First World War and that many of them may genuinely have wanted to avoid war above all. I mean, this is a question about non-intervention here. I guess it could also just as well be about, um, about, about wider things, about the whole appeasement policy. I mean, I remember seeing that Netflix film on Munich, and interestingly, at the end, a little subtitle appears, which says that the extra time bought by the Munich Agreement enabled Britain and her allies prepare for war and ultimately led to Germany's defeat, which I'm sure, I'm not sure you would agree with. I'm, I'm, I think it's... Well, I, th I think if the British had, had kind of supported their green a bit longer, they'd have bought even more time. Sure. To, to, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a, that's a, a somewhat meretricious argument. But the, the basic problem here is that, you know, as I used to say to my students, the opposite of non-intervention is not intervention. The opposite of non-intervention is not having a non-intervention agreement, which allows the, the Republic in concordance with international law to buy arms on the open market from whoever will sell it, from the Czech Republic, from, from, from Belgium, whatever, right? Open above board. That is the opposite. No one was asking Britain to send troops. No one was asking Britain to get involved. The opposite of, of non-intervention is not British intervention, except in the, in the matter of not having a non-intervention policy. So I think that that falls. I mean, that's not quite, you know, you can, you can, you could, we could address on other issues whether or not betrayal is too strong a term, but that's a misunderstanding about what the opposite of non-intervention is. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to have to send Britons to fight. You know, uh, you know, cons cons yeah, sure. It's not sure, about sure. British official involvement in the Spanish Civil War. Paul? Well, <clears throat> the, the question is, is the word betrayal an overstatement? Of course, at one level it is because you know, it, that would imply that the British government was betraying a loved one. It was betraying, <laughs> it was betraying um, you know, an entity, yeah, in the, case, it, the Spanish yeah. Republic, to which it owed some form of loyalty. And then clearly that wasn't the case. Um, but I think we're, and it's absolutely true, um, as we've just been reminded, that the, uh, you know, th those who had been through the First World War the horrors of the First World War certainly led to a determination right across the political spectrum of you know, never again, of not, not risking, in this case, you know, British, British males in, in, in another conflagration. However, where I think the, the word betrayal is appropriate is that it's a betrayal, as, as, as Churchill pointed out, of British strategic interest. It made much more sense to intervene early against um, you know, ax Axis expansionism. And there's quite a lot of evidence. I mean, I've published it in when I've been writing about Mussolini that, um, you know, that, that at, at, the, at first, you know, well, throughout, in fact, German intervention was extremely limited. I mean, it was very high tech, very focused. But it was quite clear, and the Germans consistently made this clear to Mussolini, they didn't want to send large-scale forces because it was a risk. They didn't want to risk 
the British becoming, you know, being alerted to what was going on. And Mussolini, because I mean, for psychological reasons, at one level was quite disappointed by this, but at another, he loved the idea that that made him, the, you know, gave him the lead part in the Axis uh, role in the in, in, in the Spanish Civil War. But I mean, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that there were various moments when a more robust attitude of the British government could very well have stopped. And, you know, one is often asked, oh, you know, what would have happened if, if the Spanish Republic had won the Civil War? Well, the first way to answer that is to say, well, how could it have won the Spanish Civil War? It could only have won if the British had not pursued uh, non-intervention. But many of those who've written about this say, oh, well, you know, if the, the Republic had won, there would have been a Soviet Spain, which is absolute nonsense. I would argue, and we probably need another one of our annual get togethers to examine this. I argue that if there hadn't been non-intervention, that if the British government had, wake, had, had woken up to, to the real situation, there wouldn't have been a Second World War because Hitler would have been stopped long before it became necessary. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think we would need <clears throat> at least an hour and a half just for that alone. Um, okay, another uh, interesting question um, about Negrin. Um, well, it specifically relates to the withdrawal of the International Brigades and asking how much he would have known about what was going on in, um, in Czechoslovakia, um, so how much of the withdrawal of the international brigades in the civil war owed to what was going on in Europe rather than, say, the Soviet Union or Spain itself? Well, I, I mean, I'm, Helen will have a view on this. I mean, I think if the, I mean, the first thing to say is, you know, Negrin had a quite unique knowledge of what was going on in Europe. You know, Negrin unusually amongst world leaders at the time, or, you know, uh, and certainly of Spanish leaders of any time, you know, spoke reasonable English, very good French, very good German, very good Russian. So, you know, he it, it, it was certainly on the ball. He knew what was going on. I think, and this is actually where you need to come in, Richard, I think at that at the stage at which the international brigade, you know, the, the gesture of you know giving up the international brigades, which was see, which I think was intended, you know, as a vain hope that if yeah. we give up our foreign forces, well, then well. it might yeah. impel the British and the French and the Americans to put pressure on the Germans and the Italians to 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 be, to be withdrawn. Obviously, that didn't happen. But I suspect that by that time, I don't think the international brigades were that important militarily to, to the Spanish yeah. Republic. But you'll know about that more than I do. Well, there would be little I could add to do to that. No, you're absolutely right. By that stage, they were, you know, they'd taken so many casualties. There were few left. And I think, you know, in, in many respects, it was a kind of, I mean, I assume Negrin knew it was unlikely to work, um, but he had no other options on the table. Um, and at least at least it might shame the British and French governments into, into finding some way to delay. But I mean, I don't think it was ever likely to happen, but I assume that's what he was trying to do. Sadly, I think it was it was. Yeah, it was. I mean, even though he had he had no choice, I think it was he was always doomed to fail. There's no way that Hitler and particularly Mussolini were going to withdraw all their troops. I mean, just, but why would they want to do so when they're in the position they were in? And then have you got anything to no, add? No, I mean, he had nothing to lose in doing it, yeah. I mean, for, for all the reasons that, you, that have been outlined. I didn't actually think his Russian was that good, in fact. I thought he spoke um, German with his wife, but there you go. He was married to a white Russian, which is... Although long, long separated from us, but anyway. <laughs> but I, I might be wrong, but I didn't think it was anyway. Well, well, he was a polyglot and a, and a magnificent, yeah, and in, yeah, he was magnificently a, well connected and 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 informed, um, a Renaissance man, in fact, yeah, mm. in every sense. Yeah. Much underrated, I think. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah, an, an amazing man. Yeah. Okay, this is 
Ah, uh, yeah, this kind of crops up regularly in a way. Um, the question is, is the outbreak of the Second World War so shortly after the Spanish Civil War a coincidence? No. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite easy to answer. That's a coincidence. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. I mean, you know, and this, this goes back to the, the very first things I was saying about how annoying it is that so many books on British, German, Italian foreign policy in the 1930s ignore just how crucial Spain was in A, exposing the weakness of appeasement, B, emboldening Hitler and Mussolini, and in that sense, therefore, being a rehearsal for the Second World War. In, in a way, uh, what is remarkable isn't the interval between the end of the Spanish Civil, Civil War at the end of March 1939 and the outbreak of a, a, a general war in September. It's actually um, how long that interval was. Helen, you got anything to say? Or simple no, yeah, a simple. <laughs> okay, the next question is is kind of post nineteen thirty nine, and it's about how far uh, the non interventionist policies impact impacted on the de de defeated Republicans post thirty nine or post forty five. In other words, what extent was the reluctance or inability to come and support the anti-Franco uh, actions and the and the the, the the repression. How how much of that was influenced by our early non-interventionist policies? I don't think I, I'm not sure. I see any any link. Actually, I think that you know once the Second World War started, none of the decision makers in Britain or France or, you know, were really thinking about Spain. Um, it quickly became, you know, the, a, a, a very big foreign policy issue about where would, where would Franco be, you know, was he going to line up with the Axis? And of course, there then was a competition throughout between the Allies and the, and the Axis throughout the Second World War to keep Franco neutral. Uh, bizarrely, because I don't think people realise this, uh, it was actually, apart from the very early stages, when it would have suited Hitler very much for Hitler to come in, sorry, for Franco to come in on his side, actually for most of the Second World War, uh, both Hitler and the Allies would were to derive benefit, or what, what they thought was in their interest was to maintain Spanish neutrality. As it was. This, of course, allowed Franco later on to boast about his heroism in, in uh, keeping out of the Spanish Civil War, sorry, out of the Second World War, when actually he was gagging to get in because he thought he would uh, be one of the recipients of the spoils of war. But actually what was happening in terms of the defeated Republicans, I mean, the, the, you know, the key is in the word defeated. Um, you know, half a million people had gone into exile. Um, within Spain, there were a million people in concentration camps, you know, ma massive repression. Um, there was, as far as I know, and I have studied this quite a lot, there was no interest really in British official circles for the fate of the defeated Republicans. Um, the French, of course, had initially uh, reacted I suppose as best they could, but overall quite badly to the to the influx of half a million refugees. I mean, there's all you know, not not the first refugee crisis uh, that the world would see, and certainly not the last. But um, obviously, fairly soon, the French started to try to use the Spanish exiles. Um, either you know they were given the choice; they could either join the Foreign Legion or they could become uh, laborers, you know, on the Maginot line, et, et cetera, et cetera. All of which, of course, made them um, targets for the Germans once France was occupied. But, you know, I, in a way, I don't think the defeated Republicans play a, a significant role in the Second World War. Well, I mean, the, except, well, if you, if you mean not, you know, a 
decisively in a in a kind of macro way. No, but they did fight on every front. I mean, I think it's oh, yeah, pointing yeah. out that yeah, yeah. No, no, <laughs> uh, on every front, um, uh, uh, which is an extra, you know, quite an extraordinary. You know, if you think about that, it's quite an extraordinary. Yes, uh, absolutely. You know, you know? Spanish Republicans covered the British retreat from Dunkirk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Spanish I mean, Republicans it's... were involved in, you know. The, the Narvik. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're absolutely everywhere. They were, you know, they were internees in the in the Channel well, Islands. Unfortunately, you know, these are anecdotal. I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. But I mean, but yeah, but I think it's well. I still think it's worth making the point. No, it's symbolic. It's extremely, extremely important for a long time. That was if you kind like, point, you know, completely. you know, the fact that the liberation of Paris was carried yeah, out was, by Spanish yeah, and yeah, yeah, It's yeah, yeah, important, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it is symbolic rather than. Yeah. Indeed. I mean, of course, it was I mean, it's not quite the question that was being asked, but of course, the fact that the world's attention was elsewhere between 1939 and 43 was um, quite handy for Franco in terms of the, the era of the wild camps and the extrajudicial, you know, the continuation of the extrajudicial killing and the, the, the worst of the, of the, uh, you know, the mass imprisonment and the whole shebang of the of the repression after the he won the battlefield war. I mean, when, you know, in a sense, the, 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 the putting of, you know, the, the kind of change in way in the way that that control and, and the repression is going to is going to look from from after Stalingrad is very significant, I think. I mean, I don't think, you know, that's the point where, you know, that is the point when the, the, the Franco starts to um, offer them or the regime starts to offer the mass pardons, which will empty the jail of the, of the, of the you know, of, you know, tens and tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of, of people. Um, that is in, it's partly about the, the the nature of the penal regime because they don't dis, they don't move out into freedom they move out into a, into other regimes of control outside the prison walls but that in a sense that the, the kind of clearing it out and, and sorting it out has got something to do with the turn of the second world war you know the 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 the, the outcome of stalingrad and the beginnings of the of the of the realization that well actually the axis is star is waning um, but but it, you know it was jolly handy. I mean not the, I mean the Foreign Office reports are full of um, reports of you know they can hear the executions and the and the and the the the, the um, execution squads the bullets ricocheting from the East Cemetery in Madrid. They can hear it in the in the um, you know in the, yeah, the, the, the the British Foreign Office had plenty of reports about the scale mm. of the killings. But I mean they weren't. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, coming back to British reactions to Spain. Um, somebody's asking about dissenting voices, essentially, um, within the kind of government or the ruling class, as you, however you want to de define it. What evidence is that there, there were people who were speaking out with influence against non-intervention? Now, the, there's no date given here. So I guess, you know, to Churchill, if you asked him the question in, Germany 1937 would give a very different answer to Churchill in January 1939. So I guess how many other people changed? Or... Resignation, I suppose. Yeah. Well, was that was that over Spain or was that over Italy or was it both? It it was disquiet. Uh, pass. It was disquiet. <laughs> it was disquiet at the momentum. Of, of Axis involvement in Spain and where, at least this was part of that momentum and where it was leading, I think, in terms of a worry about, not about Spanish democracy, but about yeah. British, British interests. Paul? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not aware of, um, you know, anyone famous or, uh, you know, in terms of diplomatic staff, uh, I think, you know, there's evidence of certain you know, Ogilvy, Ogilvy Forbes in Madrid yeah. had, you know, shall we say, doubts, a certain disquiet, but not not enough. Well, not that he could have done much about it. Um, you know, at, at the end of the war, in um, you know, when during the Casado coup, the whole issue, um, you know, in Valencia, uh, Cowan. The, the you know the the, the, the British uh, agents there um, obviously had a degree of sympathy with the Republicans, but again, what did they do? They helped Casado. Of course, Casado was in cahoots with the Francoist uh, Fifth Column. So 
you know, and, and Britain, of course, the, you know, Britain, as, as we know, hardly accepted any uh, refugees, very limited number uh, of refugees then, as now. Um, you know, so I can't, I mean, I'm not saying it, it, there weren't, but I can't think of significant. I mean, there was the guy who, uh, I mean, you know, the people who uh, welcomed um, Basque children in 1937, um, the arist I can't remember the name, the aristocrats who, um, it, on, on whose land Artur Barreo, uh, Artur Barrea. Uh, lived. I can't remember his name now. But, you know, there, there were individual cases, but nothing crucial, I would say. So fairly. OK. OK, thank you. Right. We've now got a question from somebody in Sweden um, asking about non-intervention. Um, how important was uh, the European consensus on um, non-intervention? Um, was it really, was it, was it, yeah, how how important was it, and how how far was it a uh, kind of betrayal by Britain and France, or a betrayal by you know the the democracies in general? Can I just say before either of us goes in that there's just been a little notification from Simon Martinez, quite rightly, a telling me that the person to whom I was referring was Lord Farringdon, but also pointing out, as of course we all forgot. Uh, the Duchess of Athol as a, an aristocratic voice in favour of uh, of the Republic. Yeah. I think very briefly in response to the question, it's almost impossible to talk about any kind of European consensus, given that, you know, on the one hand, there were the democracies, and on the other hand, the, you know, the, the Axis powers and, and, and their satellites in a way. So it, it, it consensus would have been very difficult. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Leon Blum consensus with the, with the British gun to his head. <laughs> sort yeah. of, said, you, you, you intervene on, on the behalf of the Republic and if, if, there's, if, there's a, if there's German come back, you're on your own sunshine sort of thing. You know, it's kind of, the, and, and it, I think there isn't, a, the, the, there's a lot of different things going on under the surface, but if we, if we accept that Britain and France are in the kind of, in the forefront of non-intervention, although obviously with, French, it was a very different practice because there was this policy of non, non relaxed non intervention, non intervention relâche, where the, the frontier keeps opening, closing, opening, closing, depending on you know which particular um, configuration of the future the French are thinking about in terms of will it be better to try and keep the republic alive or do we have to make an, a you know try and make nice to the Francoists and you know who in who it is in inside France that we're hearing is it the, you know the French military is it is it the popular front if is it, is it like Leon Blum. I mean, in the end, I, I don't think I've changed my view on, on, on Leon Blum in that, you know, he was under this pressure from the British and they, the, the, the French were terrified of being about being left isolated, you know, surrounded by, you know, kind of, of, of enemies. But Leon Blum was trying to get through a social reform program as well. And he was trying to keep the radical party in the co I mean, the Popular Front in France was a coalition of, of warring parties, really. And I think in a sense, I've, I've said it long ago, and I don't think I think any differently now that he he was trying to keep things together to get that reform package through in France at the expense of of, of, a, of a stronger position towards the Republic in, in Spain. And in the end, of course, it didn't work. I mean, the French Republic, um, sorry, yeah, the French Republic, the, the Popular Front governments spent more on rearmament than on social reform in the end, you know, but, but um, it was, it, I think this idea of, a, you know, what European consensus, you know, what, what you know, um, it, that's not really a word I would use. Okay. Um, going back to a uh, previous question in a way, um, the second betrayal it's referred to here. Um, was there ever a chance that Britain would support an attack on Spain? Now, the question says after Germany was defeated, but I think uh, if we could bring it forward to within the Second World War as well? Or was it certain from the start that Franco would be allowed to stay in power? Well, I, <laughs> I, I think it's highly unlikely that, um, I mean, given the, um, you know, the, the overall 
configuration of power. The fact that both the British and the Americans believed that after Stalin had moved, you know, had, had got as far as, as Berlin, that you know, there was this fear that, you know, ne next stop Paris, next stop London, that in that sense, Franco acquired an immense value. Um, that they didn't want to sh uh, rock the boat because, and in fact, it would be a question of not so much rocking the boat, but rocking the aircraft carrier because Spain yeah, yes, had an immensely valuable and has an immensely valuable geopolitical position. Important. You know, uh, with the Atlantic on one side, the Mediterranean on the other, uh, sh sheltered from the rest of Europe by the Pyrenees, it was perceived by the, the top military brass first in America, but then in Britain, as the, the place where, if indeed the Soviets were to invade Western Europe, that the fight back would have to begin from Spain. And therefore, there was never any question of um, undermining Franco. And even before, if you, if you just wind back a bit to, to the to the time slightly before then, when it was all slightly more fluid, you know, you know before sort of like... 47 48 or whatever in it, it, it there's a sense that you know you know franco is i mean and we know that this is a is a is a is a, a, a cosmetic effect as well but that they are unified that the republic precisely because of the fallout from the defeat in the war the the, the kind of immense sort of fragmentation and internal arguing within the Republican camp. And I mean, obviously this also shadows or reflects the Cold War because you know that you get the ostracism of the, of the Communist Party and the arguments about you lost the, who lost the war. Blah, blah. Um, all of that, of course, is a, is a, is a kind of um, tableau vivant, which is very dis, you know, distasteful for people who are already, pre in the, Brit in the British particularly, who are already prejudiced against um, against you know the, what the republic was, who you know can just say, well, look, there are there are a load of ra rowing people. How could we put them into? How could we possibly put them into power? Um, so in, even before you know the Cold War hotlines solidify and harden, it's um, and Franco was very adept not only at playing the anti-Franco card but also playing the Catholic one. <laughs> I mean, this notion that they were all just unconsciously good Catholic boys and girls. No, they weren't. It was it was a, it was an effect. You know, I mean, more than one. I think it's Carrero Black, you know, Franco's alter ego, Carrero Blanco, who says it later when it's still, you know, the Catholic card is still being played. But he actually says, La Cosa Católica va muy bien en Washington. The, ca the Catholic business plays out very well in Washington. You know, they were really conscious. Of, of manipulating um, things as well. So uh, none of this is just, act, you know, it's, it's, they're not just unconscious traditionalists, they're using it, you know, so, but no, obviously the, the answer is the same, that there was no chance of, no, no likelihood or ever, any, ever a serious moment of dislodging Franco. Yeah, there was, there was, during the Second World War, there was an SOE unit that was set up that included Peter Kemp, who'd actually fought for Franco, as you know, during the Civil War. And he was involved with another of, uh, of Spaniards in a unit that were, were told that they were to train to be parachuted back into Spain at some mm -hmm. future event. But yes, neither of you will be surprised to know that nothing actually came of it in the end. And it, they were all disbanded and sent off into other areas. Well, the American special services, I mean, the same, they had all, but it never came to anything. Yeah. Okay, well, perhaps. Um, we're beginning to run out of time. So perhaps going back to what we were originally talking right at the start of this of, of, of today. Um, now, as we were, talk, we were talking then about the, the, the how many people like to talk about drawing comparisons between different wars, and we're all seeing that this is now going on between Spain and Ukraine. And given that, and this is, picks up kind of your point earlier, which, which is quite right, from about Tim Bouvery and that Spain doesn't appear very often. And given that, of course, very little is taught in British schools about the war in Spain and the involvement in the international games, why is it, well, first of all, why do you think it is then that the topic does possess such resonance? And also a much more open and difficult question is how, in what way do you think that these comparisons between 
say, Ukraine and Spain are helpful or in fact not? Well, as far as, far as you know, why the Spanish Civil War still uh, generates interest, I mean, obviously, in, in the UK, the focus is largely the IBMT, and in the United States, it's largely uh, ALBA, you know, the, the sort of equivalent organization in the States. But I think that, uh, you know, there is the memory uh, or you know, the sort of family memories of, of, of volunteers at the time. But there's also this thing which I think is absolutely crucial, you know, that the Spanish Civil War is still perceived as the last great cause. And you know, the Great Romantic War, in I mean, in the reality on the ground was anything but romantic, but is perceived in that way. Um, sadly, I think one of the uh, the issues is the abiding popularity of George Orwell's homage to Catalonia, which remains, of course, the probably the, 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 not sure how it how it compares with Helen's very short introduction to the Spanish Civil War, but it's <laughs> probably one of the best-selling books ever uh, on, 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 on the Civil War, uh, as is probably most of Millions you know, of I don't countries. agree with, I disagree with a lot of it. But I think the fact that a, a writer of the importance of Orwell, you know, was there, the fact that Hemingway was there, you know, the, 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 there are a whole series of things that uh, I think have kept the Spanish Civil War, um, uh, you know, a, a burning issue. Um, but the to tell also that sorry, just to say oh. the fact also that within Spain it is still a very burning well, issue. Yeah, the reason why well, you know, Spanish politics yeah, is deeply divided yeah, yeah. over it. As far as comparisons with um, Ukraine are concerned, I mean, obviously there there, there are obvious ones about uh, empire hungry dictators, but um, and the, the big difference, of course, when you know Liz Truss made her. I think illegal, given the existence of the 1870 Foreign Enlistment Act, uh, when Liz Truss made her illegal encouragement of volunteers, uh, I think that the risks to volunteers are far greater even than they were in 1936, when there yeah. was a, a minimal degree of, if you like, technological parity between fighters on both sides. Um, now, I don't think that would be the case. But anyway, sorry, Helen, I, I interrupted. No, 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 I actually wanted to, I wanted to rewind. I wanted to ask you, in, in a sense, the question that, you know, I constantly, I mean, this is not about Ukraine, I'm afraid. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say something deeply unfashionable, which is basically that we can make, I think, very cogent comparisons in, and contrasts in, in any number of regards. I don't think they necessarily tell us anything about Spain or the Ukraine in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the absolute salient crux of what's going on right now. So I don't think it necessarily does. Not that that's a reason for us not to do it, but I don't think, I think it doesn't necessarily tell us anything really important. Um, but my question, actually, I wanted to go backwards and say, you know, we can talk about why the, there is still kind of a, an, an interest and a, and a, and a kind of currency around the Spanish Civil War, which also I think has to do with issues of social inclusion as well, in terms of how students see it as well, and you know, students are a different body. But I wanted to ask Paul, turn it round and say, the thing I'm really still interested in most, and it's the most difficult question to answer, is why the abiding um, refusal of the mainstream British history <laughs> to actually integrate it, either at the level of, um, you know, for, the foreign policy we're talking about, you know, the, you know, Bouverie's four references, or, you know, in terms of the, the social history of interwar Britain. So, you know, you have a study of um, mobilization, humanitarian mobilization around um, the Spanish Civil War. We've got a couple of two, three books now. Last, last one, I think, is, is um, Emily Mason's. But anyway, it's not integrated, though, is it? It's, it's a kind of niche study. It, it, the, the, the mainstream sort of history doesn't take it and run with it. And I'm, I'm sort of think that this is somehow about the retrospective impact of the Cold War. 
because I still think mainstream British historians see the Spanish Civil War. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say about a historian, isn't it? That they're kind of, you know, they're foxed by that, you know, the retrospective influence of Cold War ideology, but they're actually seeing it through, you know, through the, well, you know, the fact that George Orwell, to name him again, still crops up in any number of studies as if it were an empirical source, you know, and yet, and, and you've got 30 years of Spanish history, specialist historiography, which doesn't crop up, you know, in in the, the, the kind of bibliographies of mainstream, you know, insofar as, you know, anything is talked about in regard of Spain. But anyway, the, the, I'm going off on an angle now, but the basic question is a big one. Why is there that blanking? within British mainstream historiography. Well, obviously- It's blanking there that, is. So, yeah, well, I mean, as I said earlier, certainly in, in terms of international policy, there has been this view, you know, that, that, that there's a line that goes, you know, from London to Paris, yeah, yeah, yeah. Berlin, Moscow, with possibly a bit of a detour to Rome, but, <laughs> but, Spain, but Spain is ignored. And the, and the answer is, you know, actually is ignorance. Um, I, I don't there's anything more to that. The one thing in terms of what's taught, I mean, when I first began, you know, as a, as a university lecturer in, 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 in the early 70s, um, to be teaching the Spanish Civil War was as sexy as all get out because the, the big figures, apart from Hugh Thomas, uh, the, the big figures were people who'd worked on, on the 19th century, hardly even on the First World War. So when I started teaching, you know, the Spanish Civil War was immensely attractive. At the LSE, for instance, uh, where I still have my links, the, there is no interest because now the interest is in all kinds of, you know, the, even the Cold War is getting to be old hat. You know, it's the Arab-Israeli conflict. It, 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 you know, it, it's Putin for that matter. Um, so I think that, you know, that the issues that people get interested in move on with, you know, the, the chronology in which we live. But of course, it is the bane of <laughs> the three of us on screen at the moment. It's the bane of our lives, how, how little interest um, our work generates. It, interestingly, uh, I mean, as someone who also has a, a big interest in Italian history, um, in terms of British historiography, Italian history is virtually as ignored. I mean, there are popular biographies of Mussolini, but apart from that, books on Italy are as few and far between as, as books on Spain. Mm. Germany, of course, remains, you know, uh, up front, as does Russia, but um, even France, there's not so much nowadays on French history, you know, or certainly of the interwar period. Helen, do you want to add anything? No, I just don't think we've got to the bottom of it yet. <laughs> Although everything that Paul says is perfectly, you know, right and, and legitimate, but I don't think it's... Well, the only, I, way, we, the only way we get think... to the bottom of it would be a referendum in which people were obliged to answer the question, why aren't you interested in the Spanish Civil <laughs> War? Ah, but you see, it's not just not being interested. I think it's like a can of worms they don't want to open, um, which which is why I, I raise the issue of, of anyway, this is this is a discussion for another time, but I still think it's it is tied up with I think if people were afraid to know about it, they'd have to know a bit about it in the first place to be afraid about it, don't you think? Yeah, that's complicated, but I'm not sure that's really... Yeah, I don't well, think it again says what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. historians are complicated people. Well, there are, there are perhaps two positives. The first is that whenever the issue of volunteering for a foreign war comes up, the Spanish Civil War and the International Brigades are always the reference point that, that is being used. And that's not just by, by us and people on the left. And it's, I mean, I, I had the Telegraph uh, asking exactly about that question. So clearly, at least the idea of people from Britain going away to, to volunteer in a foreign war is something that people are interested in that maybe we can use as a means of engaging people with, with wider discussions. There's also been an interesting post um, here on the chat. Um, well, I'll quote it verbatim. History school teacher here 
the Spanish Civil War is increasingly appearing in school curricula. Mm -hmm. It features reasonably heavily in the international baccalaureate curriculum. There are A-level units on the Spanish Civil War uh, now, and even in key stage three of the English natural, uh, national curriculum. And there's a wonderful section in the new textbook, which begins with a banner displayed at a Celtic football ground, commemorating the death of an international brigade who had also been a, a Celtic fan. So there are, there are perhaps some politics positives for us to uh, to look at. Excellent. Well on that note I think we're we're about at four o'clock um, unless there's any has anybody got any last questions that they they'd like to to put into the chat if so I think we've got a couple of minutes. No well at the bottom of the chat everybody uh, you will find a thanks from uh, the IBMT for joining us in the online conversation today. And just a little, just a little request that maybe you, you might consider joining the trust, renewing your membership, or perhaps giving a donation. The, as uh, and Marlene has already said, the IBMT does a great deal of work looking after memorials, organizing events like this, and making sure that the, the contribution of the people who, who went from Britain and Ireland and belong and fought in the, in the Spanish Civil War is is never 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 forgotten so um thank you very much everybody for coming along today um and hopefully we'll see you all when we have a similar discussion next year <laughs>